<laughs> All right. So we're good. Well, thank you everyone for coming here. Uh, so well, some of you don't know me. My name is Cedric Honnet. Uh, I'm a research engineer in embedded systems applied to in human computer interaction. Uh, I work at this university over there. It used to be well, whatever. Uh, but I work on this project called Hive Tracker, which is um, a miniaturization of this big thing uh, that basically allows people to 3D position objects uh, in virtual reality. Uh, so this project is in partnership with a lab in London uh, from UCL, uh, they're like a neuroscience lab, uh, another lab in Spain, um, also kind of neuroscience, and I'm more in the robotic side. Uh, so the context is uh, virtual reality. Uh, I think all of you know um, HTC Vive. Uh, ah, we have a late person. <laughs> All right, I'll keep going. Uh, so any of you doesn't know the special parts, uh, special aspects of the HTC Vive? You're all good with it? They're basically positioned in 3D. Hi. <laughs> um, so you know exactly where the head of the user is. You know where their hands are. Uh, and so it allows you to do very surprising things in 3D. Uh, if you ever, if you never tried it, it's, it's really worth it. Uh, I recommend. Uh, but the problem is, if you want to 3D localize something like a hand, uh, you see the, the size of an object is like, it's like a, an orange. So you cannot track everything you want. Uh, I'm going to explain a bit what we want to do with it, why we try to miniaturize it. Um, but I think the most interesting part of what I can show is how this thing works, because it's, it's pretty smart. Um, and how we went from this orange that we just so, a big object, uh, to a much smaller object. Um, so basically, a bit like um, the GPS system, you have lighthouses that are generating an infrared lasers. Uh, yeah, infrared lasers. Um, and, and you can localize yourself according to their signals. Um, the way it works, basically, the, the, the infrared laser goes through a, a lens that diffracts it and creates a nice line that either scans or horizontally or vertically. So to simplify the way it works, you have to imagine that you are maybe somewhere. Um, let's look, for example, here. So if you know that you are somewhere on this line uh, and you want to localize yourself on this line, you have to imagine um, a lighthouse that, se that sends, a, uh, let's say, a double flash to say, I'm going to start counting. And then you imagine the scan uh, that comes. And when it hits you, you can calculate the angle between, let's say, the zero at my left and where you are somewhere on this line. So if you, if you know exactly where you, are, where you are on one line, because you counted one, two, three, tuck. you have an angle, maybe 30 degrees. If you know how to do that and you do it perpendicularly, you can have two angles. Um, so you, you do a scan horizontally and a scan vertically. And with two angles, you can estimate your position with a, a, a line, a kind of vector coming from a, a base that could be, as you can see on the, on the animation, at, at the corner of a room. And this line points at you. But if you are in three dimension, one line is not enough. You need another one. So you are at the intersection of the two lines uh, if you have another base. So basically, what we see is one of them, but you need two. So the idea of this project was to uh, convert time in angle, as what I was explaining, like the three microseconds could be, for example, 30 degrees. So you you have this flash that I was talking about. It's like a double flash to say start. And then you count one, two, three. And then there's another flash. Oh. Did I touch something? No. 
ok Is it wireless? Yeah. All right, very good. So we have one angle with one timing, one other angle with the other timing, and that's for. Well, it looks like it's three bases, but it's one base, and, and so one base will give you one uh, one line in 3D, and the other base will give you the other to have the intersection. So we can count the time. Um, I'm not going to go through those timings, but uh, basically, they are very uh, accurate and very fast um, timings because the idea is to, to localize someone in 3D uh, with a quarter of millimeter accuracy, five meters away from the base. So the first prototype used only one photo sensor that is receiving the laser signal that uh, I was just talking about and a microcontroller that's pretty fast. Um, some of you might know it, it's called the TNC. Uh, I mean, the, the board is called the TNC. And uh, the microcontroller runs at 120 megahertz, so it's 120 millions of instructions per second, which means that we're fairly accurate. The problem is that if you have an object with only one photo sensor, when it's not looking at the, the base, you don't, you don't know where you are anymore. So you need at least four photo sensors so that with this kind of um, tetrahedric shape and if you are in any orientation possible you always have one photo sensor that can see the base but you have to be able to measure the timings for the four hello <laughs> the four photo sensors and if you want to do that normally you would do it with um, some very complicated electronics that I'm going to talk about, but I don't know why this slide is here. I think I should move it. Uh, but basically, <laughs> what the, the first prototype did was uh, to do some kind of uh, 3D graffiti. Um, and some of the applications of what uh, my lab uh, wants to do are like um, documenting unique and maybe dying handcraft um, traditions uh, in something like the makerspace of the future. Um, the lab in England that I was talking about, uh, they want to track uh, rats and put electrodes around their brain so that they understand what's happening when they are changing their, their path. Um, other, many other applications are possible, but um, yeah, there's this list, um, whatever. So if we go deep in the details of the timings, that w which I'm not going to do right now, uh, we can see that how accurate we need to be and how uh, we need very um, particular processors. So is anyone here not very familiar with the concept of FPGA? Some of you not there, okay. So a microcontroller is a small processor uh, to which you give a set of instruction. They, they have to do things sequentially. And you have to imagine the code that you put in it is a bit like, a, like any script that you would give to a, a, a theater um, actor. Uh, when you give code to an FPGA, it's more like the DNA of the, the electronic circuit that you want to give birth to. You have to give it what it has to be, not what it has to do. It's a really different way of um, approaching the problem. So those components are usually pretty big, but if you dig around, you can find some pretty small ones. Um, so there's this project uh, that you might have heard of on Hackaday that made a, a really tiny FPGA development board. So we could put that on, on this board it's not impossible, uh, but if we find a way to avoid it, it's even better. <laughs> so digging in the data sheet of this magic uh, microcontroller, um, the NRF52 by Nordic Semiconductors, I found that there is a kind of FPGA that allows you to connect things in hardware and do real parallel processing. So as we have 
four photodiodes listening to uh, what I was saying, like all of the lasers coming from everywhere. Um, we want to be able to parallel process these signals and give them a timestamp. Uh, and if we don't do that really in parallel uh, with the common way to do, which is doing an interruption, time step the first, doing a, another inter interruption, time step the second, and so on, you lose accuracy because uh, the time that you spent doing the first time stamp will delay the second, the third, the first, the fourth, and you don't know which one came first in the, the next one. So this magic thing, PPI, for peripheral I forgot what interconnection. I think I think it's peripheral peripheral interconnection, yeah. because basically you can connect um, a, a digital input a GPIO. Programmable peripheral interconnection. Thank you. Programmable peripheral whatever it, uh, interconnection. Uh, so you can connect a GPIO, a timer, um, many other peripherals. Uh, the idea here is to just connect the the, the photodiodes to a timer and measure the timings. So um, I use this magic little uh, microprocessor that we can see here. Um, all, the, all the details of this board are on the, the website. Uh, but basically this guy is pretty smart because it has the microprocessor, the Bluetooth communication module, the antenna, all of the components that you need to make it work like the, the capacitors, uh, and the two quads, one low frequency when it wants to sleep and be in low power, and one high speed to do the, the radio communication. This other guy here is um, a nine degrees of freedom motion sensor, so it can measure its orientation, its accelerations, uh, and it does the fusion inside. It's a Bosch uh, processor. Uh, um, IMU that has a, a processor inside. Hi! <laughs> um, and then the rest is not so important here. It's uh, the power supply, LED, button. And then on the other side, we have the connectors to put the, the photo sensors. Um, so we're going to see it on, on the next uh, slide. But basically, that's the board once it's done. And it's about the size of a one Singaporean dollar coin, or one pound coin, or I don't know for the US dollar, whatever. Probably it's smaller than a quarter, I would say. Uh, so um, yeah, to give another scale, uh, after the, the assembly, it looks like it's the size of yeah, a third of one of my fingers. Um, and so the photo sensors that I was talking about, um, they have so it's, it's actually a circuit with the photosensor itself and a bit of electronics uh, made by a company called Triad Semiconductors that help to do all the filtering, the amplification, and the digital communication. Um, so this is just the first step that uh, it makes it easy to develop. Uh, so I just have to put connectors uh, to talk this like it's not very obvious, but those things are flexible, so you can put it in your 3D object if you 3D print it, or if you put it anywhere, like a candle, or I don't know. It's flexible, it takes the shape you want, and it can be shorter or longer. But the next step that would be interesting, I think, uh, would be to have almost the same object, but instead of putting connectors like these, we could put the photosensors directly on the board and give them the exact uh, orientation that we want. So those guys are through hole, it means we can solder them through hole, yeah, or we can solder them on top also. Uh, but once they are um, uh, soldered on top, we can bend them and they keep their orientation. That's the interesting part. Um, I think I can stop here and if you have more questions, I have a lot more things I can show. Uh, if you, any of you has any uh, question about how to integrate that in virtual reality or how to make boards because I understand that some of you have. Um, so you can contact me uh, on Twitter on that. Otherwise, uh, the, the website here has all of the hardware, the firmware that is in progress. Um, and I think that's it. 
Thank you for your attention. <laughs> when you say it's in progress, <laughs> how far is it? Uh, that's uh, always the hardest question, right? <laughs> um, so the way you, you analyze these timings uh, from the lasers uh, is a bit tricky. You need a kind of state machine that's using interruptions and this PPI mess, the, the special hardware that you only, I think, only find in this processor. So all of the, the fundamental blocks are pretty much done. Uh, the state machine is done. Uh, I had to modify the Arduino environment so that it works with this uh, processor because the idea is to make it as simple as possible so that anyone can use it. Um, so the Arduino environment modification is done. All of the blocks are made. So technically, it should be fast. Uh, in real, it's probably going to be a bit painful. I would say a couple of months at least. Yeah. Um, one of the interesting next steps is to use some smart filtering like Kalman or an, an improved version to use the integration of the acceleration measured by this sensor so that we can accelerate the positioning estimation because for, for now we have about 30 hertz refresh rate of the lasers because even though they are going super fast you cannot do much faster than that and 30 hertz is usually good but when you do a, a fast motion um, the acceler accelerometer could do a, a good extrapolation of the, the positioning in between this uh, 30 hertz refresh rate of the optical uh, sensing so that part is a bit tricky. Uh, I have a few students working on it right now. I'm lucky I, I can have slaves. <laughs> no, they're, they're, really, they're, they're really impressively fast and yeah, it's, it's quite cool to have them. Um, and the, the next step is I, I'm probably going to have an intern for six months working on that also. So across finger, this should be at least yeah, done in six months. You want one? <laughs> Any other question? Can, can you tell a bit more about the, the application? All right. So the question is, if I can talk a bit more about the, the applications. So um, as you can see, this is probably small enough to put on a rat. Uh, depends on how big a rat you have. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it depends on your rat. I think you have big, big rats in Singapore? We do. Yeah, OK. Well, lab rats uh, should be OK to carry that. Um, maybe Singaporean could have bigger, with bigger battery. <laughs> yeah, there's the battery that comes with it and the, the photo sensor that we saw, but should not be much bigger. Um, I think, from what I understood, I'm not a neuroscientist, but from what I understood, uh, by those guys, uh, the camp lab, they want to understand what's happening in the brain when you are in front of, uh, for example, of food or a predator or, or you're bored or these kind of things. And, and the, the orders that you give to your body, I mean, to your limbs to move around um, as a reaction to what, uh, what happens around you. Uh, it's not completely clear how it's working and uh, some animals are easy to analyze. Uh, they are pretty rare. Are, are you familiar with the cuttlefish? Cuttlefish, yeah. So it's a, it's, for those who don't know, it's a very surprising animal, a bit like the chameleon. It can change its appearance. Um, a bit like, to me, it looks a bit like an e-ink display. It has a lot of pixels on the back. <laughs> and it's really surprising when you put food in front of it, it has this kind of warrior mode. It changes its color. It's like, I'm going to fight to get that food. And when it catches it, if it's trying to get it and it's frustrated because it doesn't come, you can see the frustration on the back. Like, it has like frustrated written on the back. It's really <laughs> funny. And then when it gets it, it's like happy. <laughs> it's, it's just written on the back. So this cannot be done with rats. I mean, not as easily. And humans, we tend to change colors. Uh, sometimes like you get red when you're angry or green when you're cold or these kind of things. Um, so 
that's one of the, the experiments that are uh, uh, done by the, the lab that started this project. Um, the micro manipulation part, uh, so the third dot here, is about how to um, um, grab things. It doesn't have to be just like surgery or watchmaking. It can be like um, how to grab an atom and feel it with a haptic feedback, like a tactile resistance. Um, so there's this Teletweezer, it's a project of uh, the lab where I work uh, at Sorbonne. And they, they are basically localizing in 3D with big sensors uh, using cameras, um, the, the position of a, of a tweezer. And it, it gives you a feedback of what you're grabbing and it knows exactly where it is, but it's really big, so it's, it's not very practical. And on the other hand, it's remotely controlling um, a robot that is grabbing things, or a laser that is actually um, controlling the position of an atom, or like weird uh, things. <laughs> so with this stuff, you would have like one of these in each finger? Uh, so it's just a tweezer with a, a sensor at the end. So you know your, your orientation and your position would be a bit simpler. Um, the 3D haptic texture mapping is more for virtual reality when you're trying to um, either touch things that don't exist. How do you feel like this is a, maybe you're, you're in front of a wall, it's in bricks, or it's maybe in, I don't know, in carpet or in foam. You can maybe go through it or this kind of things. Uh, we, can ha we can create haptic illusions and make you feel like you're touching things that you're not using special vibration patterns. And the last one, the art performance, is our, um, how to visualize or sonify the movement um, using these kind of sensors, uh, for, for example, with dancers. Uh, but it could be any movement, like a, a graffiti artist doing his motion could create sound uh, on top of the visualization that's already created. And if, I, if you have other ideas, we can talk about it. Um, yeah. It's still in progress, but when all of these things uh, will be uh, working, they will be published in either on my account or this website. Any other questions? Uh, how does the sensor know when the laser start to scan? Okay. The, the timing when the laser starts and the, the timing when it receives. So it it's it's a pretty dumb sensor as you can so as you saw. Um, so yeah, the question is how does the um, sensor knows when it starts scanning? So here I didn't explain it so well. Uh, it's the superposition of several chronograms. Uh, coming from several photosensors. So here you can see there's, I do with my mouse, uh, there's four photosensors connected to this board. This is the, the official development board by Triad Semiconductors. If you graph the signals that you get from them, uh, you can see several colors for several sensors. And they basically all start at the same uh, at the same moment, and this is because the two bases, they synchronize each other. One of them is the master, basically, and the other is just the follower. So the first one will do a flash, and then the second will do another flash. Um, no, sorry, I'm talking shit. The, the first one will do a double flash, and so this is, for example, for one scan, like the, the vertical scan, I mean, the, or whatever, one of them. Uh, so it will do a double flash saying, I'm going to start now. So you should start counting. And depending on the length of this, you can estimate, I mean, you can decode using the length. Uh, you can de decode, are you going to do a vertical or horizontal scan? or are you going to sk uh, f flash from the ba base A or B? And so once you have that, you have the scan, and then depending on the sensor, 
because they are not placed at the same place, you will have uh, a pulse at a different position because different position in real time. Then this will happen again. This same thing will happen another time, but instead of being vertical, it will be horizontal and it will, the, the start signal would look almost the same, except it will say, now it's not vertical, it's horizontal. And then the second base will talk and will do almost the same. So I have to double check. I don't remember by hand, but I think, yeah, this is base A and this is base B. That's how you compare, you differentiate them. And there's like four, 400 microseconds. But basically you have to, to create a state machine that looks for a double pulse. And because this would, if you look at, at only one sensor, for example, only the red, um, this is not a double pulse with the correct length. So you have to look for this exact patterns um, with different, it's a variable double length. That's how you know. <laughs> it's a bit of a pain. I can show you more if you want <laughs> afterward. Uh, if there is any other question, maybe there's no, so you, you, would you like to show your project a bit? I think other people would be interested. It's everyone. What do you think? We can just put everything on the table yeah. and just go around like we were doing earlier. Sounds good to me.